at the end of it, what is it trying to tell you? Yeah, John, it predicts the geometry of molecules. That's right. But what's, what's at the heart of Vesper? If you had to pick one of those, um, one of these letters out, which one would it be that sort of really explains it? I mean, basically, why does Vesper work? What is it about electrons that makes this work? Because of their repulsion. Right. How, why? What? Why? Why? Why are they? What are they repulsing? Their charges. Mm hmm. And so, why is that? Um, because of the polarity. Polarity of what exactly? Of um, each of the bonds in the molecule. Okay. So basically what it's saying is that if you have, let's just look at water because water is my favorite molecule. So that's what wa water looks like, we know, right? It's got two bonds with hydrogen and it has uh, two, the oxygen has two lone pairs. So what is it that's keeping this shape? Why does it have this particular shape? Because we know that water has this bent shape. Why is that? Lone pairs on top of the oxygen are pulling down they're pulling down, pulling down what? This is what I'm trying to get at is what is it about electrons that are doing all this, that's basically responsible for all of this? Someone's, you know, we've heard polarity, We've heard charge. What is it about the charge of electrons? What is the charge on an electron? Right, it's negative. They're negatively charged. So all electrons have a negative charge. And do opposite charge, so do like charges attract or, rep or uh, repel each other? Yeah, David, exactly, they repel. So I would, would pose that the most important letter of Vesper is this R. Because that is what basically explains the shape of all molecules is the fact that electrons are negatively charged and like charges repel each other. And that's all you need to remember. But really, that's basically it. And the first activity in the lab today is basically demonstrating that because all molecules basically adopt a shape where these electron groups will be as far apart from each other as possible. So if we look at something like um, something like that, the fact that um, carbon dioxide is linear, basically that is the shape that it can adopt to keep charges as far apart from each other as they possibly can. And the way by doing that is to have this oxygen and its lone pairs and this oxygen and its lone pairs as far apart as humanly possible. And the way to do that is to put them in a line because when you have two groups, the farthest separated by something in the middle, the greatest distance you can put between this group and this group is in a straight line. Because if we were to bend that in any direction, up or down or in or out, they would, they would move closer together. So the farthest they can get away from each other is this 
straight line. That gives them 180 degrees separation. Now, what about when we have three groups? If we have, um, let's say, boron. So here's boron trihydride. What shape can those adopt to get them as far apart from each other as they possibly can? So here are the, here are the electron groups. So you remember, there's two kinds of electron groups. What are the two different kinds of electron groups? Ionic and covalent? Mm, those are different kinds of bonds. Mm -hmm. But when we're dealing with when we're dealing with these covalent molecules, there's basically there's two types of electron groups we need to consider when we're thinking about what shape they're going to the molecule is going to adopt. So what are the, what are the different kinds of of electrons we're dealing with? Polar and nonpolar. Again, that is a type, those are types of uh, uh, bonds and molecules. That tells you how the electrons are being shared. But if they're being equally shared, it's nonpolar. If they're being not equally shared, then it's polar. But there's two types of electrons that you're going to find in a molecule. Yes, Amanda, that's right. You're going to find bonding electrons like these. So these are bonding electrons. And that's one kind of electron group. And then the other kind of electron group are those electrons um, that aren't bonded. They're basically in a lone pair, like with water. So there's two types of electrons in water. There are these that are bonding, and then there's the lone pairs which aren't. So in boron trihydride, we don't have any lone pairs because we know boron is one of the um, exceptions to the octet rule. So it only has three electrons to, to, to share. So they're all the electrons in this particular molecule are bonding pair electrons, but they too need to be as far apart from each other as possible. Because when you think about it, what this bond actually is, is just a pair of electrons in space. That's a pair of electrons in space. That's a pair of electrons in space. These are a pair of electrons in space, moving around between the boron and the hydrogen, sort of like in this, in this uh, cloud. So what shape can this molecule take to make sure that each of those electron clouds are as far apart from the other one as possible? Because remember, all the electron clouds are negatively charged, so they want to be they're going to repel each other. What shape will it be? Yes, John and David. Everyone, everyone, yeah, it's a triangle. So that means what, if, what will the bond angle be between each one of the hydrogens? Yeah, 120 degrees, exactly. Because this, basically it'll make up a, a circle of 360 degrees and each one of these is gonna be 120. So the other thing is, some of you have mentioned that it's, that it's planar and that is correct. Why? Why is it essential that this be on a, on a, that this be flat? That this is a flat planar molecule? Why is that important? Why can't it be bent or distorted in, in, in some way. How come it doesn't look, for instance, how come it doesn't look like this? where all three hydrogens are below the plane of the boron, or they're all above the plane. How come they have to be in a plane completely flat?
let's you know talk this out rather what happens what happens when you have a plane and you either bend it down or bend it up what happens to the distance between each of these electron clouds they change they change mm -hmm. do they get longer or do they get farther away or do they get closer together uh, farther away well then if they're farther away wouldn't that be better actually because since they're repulsing each other any way you could get them to be farther away would actually would actually be better would actually be more stable oh. But look at it this way. So if I have my hand is like this, it's sort of basically in a plane. If I bend it a little bit like that, do my fingers get closer together or do they get farther apart? Closer together. They get a little closer together, don't they? So if this plane is changed in any way, if I bring it down this way, look at my thumbs. So my thumbs, if I bend them together, they move together a little closer. If I bend them up, they also get a little bit closer together. If they're in a perfect plane, that's the maximum distance they can have from each other, as long as they're, as long as they're in a plane. And that's all Vesper means. It's what shape can this molecule adopt that keeps these electron groups, either in bonds or in lone pairs, as far away from each other as they possibly can. And so we'll see that if we have uh, methane, for instance, so here's methane, or old pal methane, CH4. So that tells us the carbon is going to go in the middle, and I'm going to have one, two, three, four hydrogens around it. So if we just look at it in a, if we just draw it like this, like in a typical, um, Lewis structure, that looks like it's in a plane, right? Would that be the best shape for, for carbon to adapt to keep those electron groups, each one of those carbon-hydrogen bonding groups? Would a plane with 90 degree angles between each one, would that be the, the best shape to adopt to get those bonds as far away from each other as possible? Yes. Okay. So with these 90 degree angles, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, there's no other shape that could adopt to get them farther apart from each other. What other shape could we adopt? Does anyone know the actual shape of methane? Could it be a straight line? How could it, okay, what sort of straight line could it be? Because the, whoops, let me go back. Because the carbon is in the middle and they're all bonded to carbon. So we couldn't make a straight line out of them. Where is my, oh, there we go. Yeah, they're all bonded to carbon. So I can't make a straight line, basically. That's, that's, that's not going to work. Because the hydrogens are, I can't have something like this. They're all, they're all bonded to, to, to carbon. What's the actual shape? Tetrahedron, right. What does that Basically, what what is what is that? What shape is that? What what's a common? If I was if I was to ask you, like, what common thing is tetrahedral in shape? What would you like point to? Tri it's not quite a triangle because a triangle is basically a planar shape. A prism, right, either a prism or a pyramid is the, like the way I like to think about it. Um, a pyramid. So something that looks 
like that. So that would have one, two, three, four. And they're as far apart from each other as they can be. Does anyone know what these angles are? Because not, they're not 90 degrees. I mean, I didn't draw that perfectly to scale. Hundred nine, mm -hmm. one hundred nine point five. So each one of these angles is one hundred nine point five degrees, and that's as f that particular shape is the maximum distance we can get for four uh, points in space. We can't get them any further apart than that because if I move any one of them, then one of them gets closer to another. Then they snap back. To this particular shape. So that's the maximum angle I can have to keep these things apart. So how do we represent that? We represent that by putting our carbon in the middle, like we know it is, and we put our four hydrogens around it, but we just do a little trick to show that they're not all in the same plane. So if I was to just do this, you would say, well, yeah, it looks like they're all on, on the same plane and they're all 90 degree angles. So what we do to, to get around that is we show that one of them is coming out of the, of, the, uh, of the plane and one of them is going behind it. And to do that, we just do this little trick where we change two of these bonds to look like this. We use what's called a wedge and a check, and a check line. So the check line sort of gives you the optical illusion that this is behind the plane, and the wedge tells you that it's out in front. So it's a more three-dimensional looking shape. Okay, so you have like two of them are in the plane, this one, and this one. One of them's coming out and then one of them's going behind. And so that's, that's the sort of um, shapes we'll be drawing today. And so when you take, uh, in the first um, activity, when you take four balloons and you tie them together, you'll notice that they automatically takes the, take this shape. There's really, there's nothing you can do about it. They automatically take that shape. And the balloons are supposed to represent basically what the electron clouds look like because we draw bonds like this but that's not what you know with a electron over here an electron over there but that's not what they look like they look like this because they're moving around in space they're taking up space and the space is between this atom and this atom and so they they have that sort of you know balloon balloon shape so when I put four of them together, they're automatically going to look like uh, a pyramid. So let's look at some of the activities we're going to be doing. So that's going to be the first one. Um, oh, here we go. So the first one's going to be kind of be be uh, kind of fun, just basically blowing up balloons. <laughs> So I, you know, I'll do I'll do uh, the one of them with you, and they're just based, like I said, they're supposed to represent um, the electron clouds between. So if if it's in a bond, it's between two atoms, and if it's a lone pair, it's basically this balloon is sort of in space by itself. So if you have two electron domains farthest distance you can have between two things, like I said, is a line, 180 degrees separating them. When you have three, like we showed, the shape that will give you the greatest distance between all those three groups is a triangle, but in a plane. When we get to four, <clears throat> we get this tetrahedral or pyramid type shape when we get the five and six, they start looking. They start looking even, even stranger. And so we're going to learn how to like draw those uh, shapes. Okay. So okay. you got. Go ahead. 
How big do we have to inflate the balloons? You should. This should be in your... Um... And I said, how big? Oh, how big do you blow them up? Yeah. Oh, as much as, 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 much as you want. I mean, basically, yeah, I would just, you know, blow them up. So you want to leave a good amount of space in order to, to you know, tie them tie them together. So yeah, you don't have to get them, you know, huge or anything. I'll, I'll, I'll do one with you because I think, I think it'll, it'll be fun. Although I find I have, I have trouble uh, tying the balloon knots because my, my fingers are so damn big. <laughs> they kind of get in the way, but I'll give, it, I'll give it my best shot. So that's the second activity. And then the third one, we're going to sort of start working on making actual uh, models. So does everyone have their modeling set with them or found it in, in, their, uh, in, their, in their box, in their supplies? Has everyone found it? Yeah. What's well, slightly different from ones we, 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 we use in, in, in lab. Um, but you notice that each one of them, when, when we start using them, are slightly, slightly different shapes. And so basically, you look at them and you, based on how many bonds or how many electron groups each atom has, like this one, which one do you, which atom do you think this represents? It has four, first it's black and it's got four, um, electron groups all separated in a tetrahedral shape. Yeah, that's, that's carbon, right? Because basically carbon is going to make um, that shape when it doesn't have any, when it's all, all single bonds. And then there's a bunch of other ones in here and then we'll, we'll, we'll put some of them together. So basically we're going to go back to the activity you did uh, last week, that same um, same group of, of compounds and make three from group one, three from group two, uh, three from group four, and we'll build, build the, the models. And then the fourth one is looking at polarity. And so this, this, you know, really puts what you've been learning about electronegativity and shapes and puts them together because we need to understand why some molecules are polar and some molecules aren't because it's the polarity of molecules that basically uh, determines their behavior, their interactions with each other. The reason why water is polar, the reason why um, long chain carbon hydrogen uh, you know, hydrocarbons are not uh, polar, why they don't mix, that, that all that is related to not just its shape, but the polarity of the bonds in each one. So we need to learn how to, how to compute what the polarity of a bond is. And I think we, I think we pretty much know how, how to do that, right? That is taking the electronegativities of each atom in the bond and seeing what the difference is, basically seeing what delta E n, the, the, the difference in electronegativities are. And so if they have a very low difference in electronegativity, like 0.3 or less, that's a nonpolar covalent bond. Basically, the electrons are equally shared. Because what is, what is give me a, re a refresher, what does electronegativity mean? What do I mean by electronegativity? What, what, what is it a measure of? Um, like when you have a compound and it attracts other atoms to itself. Mm. It's not attracting atoms to itself. Remember, electronegativity is, is a value of an element, not, not of a molecule. So what does it mean that this element has a higher electronegativity than this one. 
what do atoms with high electronegativity do that atoms with low electronegativity don't do? They draw more electrons. Right, they draw electrons to themselves. But in what circumstance do they draw electrons to themselves? When do they do that? So it's not that they're not just attracting electrons, they're attracting a certain type of electrons. What kind of electrons are they, are they attracting? No, it's not lone pairs, David. It's the other, remember there's two kinds of electrons in, in um, molecules, lone pairs and the other kind. What's the, what's, what's the other kind? Bonding, yes, bonding electrons. So electronegativity is a measure of how strongly an atom pulls on electrons that it's bonding with somebody else. So for instance, if I have hydrogen and fluorine and they're sharing electrons, they're not actually sharing electrons equally. If we actually looked at how those electrons were being shared, we would see that the cloud wouldn't be um, equally distributed between them. What's actually happening is that if this was the cloud, most of the time those electrons would be closer to the fluorine and hardly spending any time close to the hydrogen because they're being pulled by the nucleus of fluorine, being pulled toward the fluorine. And that's why we say this is a polar bond. And we represent it by pointing towards the more electronegative. Basically, we're pointing where are the electrons going to be. That's what the arrow says. The electrons are pointing to where the electrons are going to be. They're going to be spending more time close to the fluorine, meaning that the hydrogen is going to have what's called a partial positive charge. It's not going to be completely positive. It's not a proton without an electron like H plus is, but it has a partial positive charge because most of the time those pair of electrons aren't close to the, to the hydrogen, usually spending most of their time hanging out with, with, with fluorine. So we say there's a partial positive charge in the hydrogen and a partial negative charge on the fluorine. And we use this symbol, remember, for, for, for partial. So partially negative, partially positive. But as we're learning, that's only a part of understanding why a molecule is polar. Because bonds are polar because of this change in electronegativity. But what makes a molecule polar? Why would a molecule be polar? Can you have polar bonds in a nonpolar molecule? What do you think? Is that possible? Yes. Okay. Why? How, how could you have that? Um, I think it's because like the, since the two of them are polar, they cancel each other out and they become nonpolar. Yeah, you can have, you can, you can cancel these things out. Okay. So let's just go back for a second. Let's, so this is the last, um, of the, of the, uh, activities for today. It's basically looking at the combination of polarity and shape. And so activity four, you'll be taking three of these compounds, the same ones from, from uh, the same group we dealt with before. So you did three from, uh, I think you did like Lewis structures and, and from group one, group two, and group three. So we do the same thing. And you don't have to choose the same, the same three um, compounds. You can choose three different ones. Like for instance, if we looked at PCL5. And so 
what you want to do is what's the electronegativity of those bonds. So basically the only bonds you have in that are phosphorus chlorine bonds. So phosphorus chlorine bonds. You write what's the electronegativity of phosphorus. And we can, you're given a table here. So that's right, right, in, right in the instructions. So these, this is the, uh, basically the uh, main group and elements, but some of the transition metals in there. And they give you the um, electronegativities of each one. So for phosphorus and chlorine, we would just look them up. So where are we going to find phosphorus? Where's phosphorus on the, on the table? Number 15. Yeah, right here. So what's its electronegativity? 2.1. Okay, 2.1. What is it, what's the scale of electronegativity? Two point one of what? What does, what does that even mean? What does the scale go to? Goes from zero out to what's the maximum electronegativity? Four point zero. Four. Right. Goes from zero to four. So it's basically just a scale from from zero to four. So phosphorus is basically right in the middle. It's you know, right? It's like 50% of the like, electronegativity between the least and the most. So it's smack dab in the middle. So where's chlorine? 17. Yeah, it's right. Just two over. And what's its electronegativity? Uh, three. Three, right. So you take that information. And we put down what its electronegativity is. So phosphorus would be right down here again. So phosphorus is 2.1, chlorine 3.0. So what kind of bond polarity does that give me? Basically, I have three choices. It's nonpolar covalent, it's polar covalent, or it's ionic. Those are our, basically our three are three choices. Polar covalent? Yeah, it's polar. So anything greater than about than 0.3 or less than 1.8 is considered polar. So I'll just write that down. Bond polarity is polar. Now, what does this mean? Dipole moment. Anyone tell me what that means? What is that referring to? What is a dipole? So I have to think about a couple things. What's a dipole? What's a moment? And how do I decide whether or not the molecule is polar? How do I do that? First of all, let's, we'll do one by one. One, two, three. What's a dipole? Someone explain to me what, what that means. Is it like the average polarity for a bond? Mm -hmm. Mm, not really, because we do, actually we don't consider the average um, polarity. I mean, we kind of do and we don't. It's all, when, when we get to the talking about what, why a molecule is polar, we'll, we'll definitely get into that. But what is just in general, what is a dipole? It's a pair of equal and oppositely charged magnetized poles separated by a distance. Is it always equal and opposite? 
If it's equal and opposite, I, I, I hate to tell you, if it's equal and opposite, you don't have a dipole. There's a couple of things in there that are true. It, it does involve distance. So there's a distance. And it does involve charge. But it's not, they're not equal. So what else could a dipole be? Although you did say opposite, that 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 comes into it. That 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 part of it is is true. Right, I'm Ronnie. Yes, I mean, there's no well. First of all, there's no positively charged electrons, but yeah, it's basically all a dipole is is a separation of charge in space. That's it. That's all it means. So. Um, very large dipole would be an ionic bond because in that instance, you've got a fully positive, sometimes more than plus one, it could be plus two or even plus three, or you know, plus four or five, six. You've got a positive charge and a negative charge and they're separated. And so this is a dipole and we represent a dipole like this. That this is basically, a um, symbol to tell you that a dipole exists. So that is a very strong dipole. There's two things that make a dipole strong. One is how big are the charges? The bigger the, and it's sort of represented by this equation. So we've got um, charge one and charge two and how far apart they are. So the bigger these charges are, actually they're represented by Q. Q is a, represents charge. So the bigger the charges are, the bigger the dipole is. And the closer they are, the bigger the dipole is. As, as you separate them, it becomes less and less and less um, of a dipole. Because if they're infinitely apart, Obviously, there's no dipole, but if they're really close together, it's a very, very strong. And then we start moving them apart, it becomes weaker. So a di that's all a dipole is, separation of charge in space. So, but we don't have to have a full charge. We can just have, like we saw um, with a polar bond. We can just have a slight charge, a partial charge. So this phosphorus would be partially positive and this chlorine would be partially negative because most of the, the electrons are spending more time closer to the chlorine than they are to the phosphorus. That gives us a dipole. So that's the first part. What is a dipole? What is the moment? What does that mean? The math. Okay. What's a dipole moment? <laughs> it happens only at a specific time. Yeah, not really. Sort of, but not 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 really. All right, I'll take one, 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 one more guess. No one wants to say it out loud. Yeah, I'm Ronnie. Yes, it's a measure. It's just a measure. How big is it? If it, the, dipe, the moment, just, it's just a, that's just tells you how big is it. That's it. So if it's a large dipole moment, uh, you get a big number. If it's a small dipole moment, you get a small number. So if the charges are big, you get a larger moment. And if they're closer together, you get a larger moment. And what's just adorable about it, I mean, you're not going to know this, but does anybody know what um, 
unit there are for, the, for, for measuring dipoles. It's just adorable. That is just tells you that's the, uh, that means micro. That's the relative size, but there's actual unit for, for dipoles and it's D. Anyone know what D stands for? <laughs> you would think, no, it's not actually that. It is Debbie's. It's so cute. Yeah, so we, we say there, we measure dipoles in, in, in Debbie's or Debbie's, but either one. Deb, I just think it's just adorable that they're meant that they're in Debbie's. So, so we know what a dipole is. We know what the moment is. The moment is just the measure of a dipole. How do we decide though whether a molecule is polar? Because as you've mentioned, a nonpolar molecule can have polar bonds in it. And so the question is, well, how? How, how can you do that? How does that happen? And the example, the example that's given in the um, write up for the lab is carbon tetrachloride. So carbon tetrachloride just looks like methane, but instead of hydrogen, you've got chlorines. So I've got carbon in the middle. I've got chlorine coming out. I got these two chlorines in plane, and I've got this chlorine in the back. So what's the basic, what's the difference in electronegativity between carbon and chlorine? Have a look at that table. So what's the EN of carbon? Point 0.5. Point 0.5? 2.5. 2.5, yes. 2.5. And what's the, what about chlorine? 3.0. 3.0. So my delta, my difference is 0 0.5. What kind of bond is that? Polar. Polar. So that is a polar covalent bond. And so we represent those by writing in our dipoles. And so the dipoles would look like this, right? So we've got one going like that, one going like that, one going like that, and one going like that. All pointing away from the carbon because the carbon is less electronegative than any of the, any of the, the, the chlorines. So the electron clouds of each one of those bonds is spending more time closer to the chlorine than to the carbon. That's why we have a little Debbie. We have dipoles here. So the question is, I have four polar bonds in this molecule. Is my molecule polar or not polar. And how do I decide that? Yes, John. Man, excellent. Yeah, you do vector addition. Man, you've taken you must have taken some physics, right? <laughs> because as John actually pointed out here, something I haven't mentioned and I was going to in a minute, he got ahead of me. These aren't these are actually vectors. Someone tell me what a vector is. What does a vector tell me that just a regular line doesn't? So this is a line. This is a vector. What's the difference? Yes. 
direction. That's the whole, that's the whole difference. This is just a line. I don't know whether that's pointing this way or this way or this way. I don't know what way it's pointed. When I have an arrow at the end, it's telling me what direction it is. And so that is the whole key to this is these are vectors and they're telling me that so if I have a large arrow, when I'm drawing these things, if I have a small arrow, that's telling me that I have a small dipole pointing in that direction. And if I have this, that tells me I have a larger dipole pointing in the same direction. So what I have here with this molecule, what are the size of all four vectors? Are they different or are they the same? for my carbon tetrachloride. I have carbon in the middle and four chlorines. Are the size of each of those dipole vectors the same or are they different? Same. They're all the same, right? They have to be the same because they're all, the difference in electronegativity tells you how big your arrow should be. So if it's 0.5, it should be like that big. If it's one, it should be that big. If it's point, uh, 0.7, it should be somewhere in between. So it's the size of the arrow tells you how big the, 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 the vector is. So they're all the same size. Now, what about, since they're vectors, where are they pointing? They're all pointing out to the chlorines. And if we were to add them all together, what would we get? Two. It's a little more difficult with this shape. Why don't I put it like this? Make it a little easier. Um, what if I drew this? Boron trifluoride. So we already know what shape this is, right? What shape is that? Triangle. Yeah, it's it's triangular and it's planar. So we say it's a train. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we say that it's it's a, a planar molecule. Triangular, uh, triangular planar. So if we draw the vectors, we draw the dipole vectors. What's the um, electronegativity of boron? Two point oh. Two point oh. So boron's two point oh. Fluorine's four point oh. So that's way like that's a big that's a huge difference. So when I was to draw the, the three vectors, I'm going to draw them like this. Okay, now these three vectors are all the same size, right? Because they're all the difference of electronegativity of 2.0. But they're pointing, they're separated by 120 degrees because we know that that is the, that's the shape of our planar triangular uh, molecule. If I add these three, vectors together, what do I get? If I sum them all. The thing is, would I have, would I have a dipole at the end? If I, if I sum them all together, am I going to have a net, what's called a net dipole? There'd be a dipole left over. If they're equal and opposite, I get nothing. But if one is bigger than the other, or if one is pointing in a different direction than the others, then I have a net dipole. The question is, do I have a net dipole 
with this molecule? No. No, that's right. I don't. Why? Because they're separated exactly the same. They all have exactly 120 degrees from each other. And they're all pointed in the same direction, away from the, from the, from the boron. And they're all exactly the same size. So they're the same size, pointing in the same direction, separated by the same angle. So even though they're very large dipoles with a big difference in electronegativity, boron trifluoride is not polar. Because those three dipoles, when you add them together, you get a net of zero. Same is true when you look at carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has two large has two large dipoles. You have carbon in the middle. So you have one dipole going in this direction, the other dipole going in that direction, pointing towards oxygen. But notice these two dipoles are equal and exactly opposite. Carbon is an electronegativity of 2.5, oxygen is an electronegativity of 3.5. So each of these dipoles the size of them is one, and they're pointing in equal and opposite directions. And so when I add them together, they cancel each other out. And CO2 is a nonpolar molecule. So let's go back to this carbon tetrachloride. Now I've got four chlorines. When I add those together, what am I gonna get? Yeah. Zero, exactly. Because again, even though it's a more, compli more complex shape, I have four dipoles that are all exactly the same size, that are pointing in exactly the same direction, away from the carbon, and they're all separated by exactly 109 degrees. So when I add them all together, I get nothing. But what happens if I swap one of these atoms with hydrogen. What's the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen? So we know carbon's 2.5. What's the electronegativity on hydrogen? Is it 2.1? Yeah. Yeah. So that is a difference in electronegativity of 0 0.4. So it's slightly polar. In which direction is that dipole pointing? Towards the hydrogen or towards the carbon? Which one's more electronegative? Towards the carbon. Right. So now when I point, put this dipole in, it's small and it's pointing towards the carbon. Now, when I add up this dipole, and this dipole, and this one, and this one, when I add those together, am I gonna have a net dipole at the end? Or will they, will they all cancel out? Or will there be some dipole left over? There'll be some left over. Yeah, we're gonna have a net dipole. So we're gonna have what's called a net dipole moment meaning they're not all going to cancel each other out. Because now I have not equal and non-opposite uh, dipoles. And so what we do in this situation is that we draw a net dipole. So I would have my chlorine, 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 hydrogen. So if this was the shape of, of, of my molecule, my net molecular dipole would be pointing away from the, the, from the hydrogen and towards the chlorines. So my net dipole would look, and you don't have to calculate exactly how big it is. That's, that's not the point. The point is, will there be a net dipole and in what direction will it be? And so the net dipole would be pointing in this direction. And so we say that C2 
CHCl3 is polar, where CCl4 is not. Because when there's four chlorines, the dipoles balance themselves perfectly. But when there's only three and hydrogen on the other side, that means the dipole then moves towards the chlorines and away from the hydrogen. So now we have a net dipole and we say this molecule is polar, okay? And so we're gonna be doing that with some of the molecules as well. So any questions before, before we get started? So that was the activity four table? Or That's number four, right. So what you're, gonna, what you're gonna be doing for four is taking your three molecules, I don't know which three molecules, you know, let's take these three and these three and these three. Can we use the same ones as last week? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So write down what bonds are in it. What are the, what are the um, electronegativities? So like for instance, tin dichloride. So you write down what's the electronegativity of clin, uh, clin. tin, electronegativity of chlorine. Is that a polar bond? Is it nonpolar? Is it ionic? Um, and then what dipole moment means, is there a net dipole moment? When you, so you draw out the molecule like, like we just did there. Draw it out. What shape is it? Where are the lone pairs? Where are the, um, uh, where are the dipoles? When you add all the dipoles together, do you have a net dipole? And if you do, and if you do, it's polar. And if you don't, it's nonpolar. What if I was to have a um, molecule with all nonpolar bonds? Can that be polar? So we know we can have a nonpolar molecule if all the bonds are polar. We can have that. What about the other way around? Can we have a polar molecule with all nonpolar bonds? I'm not sure, but I feel like yes, as long as one of the other bonds were different, right? Okay. But you see, um, we have to have, uh, the, we have to have basically, um, if we don't have like a much, if we don't have much of a dipole anywhere, then even if we have like a super tiny net dipole, that's not enough to make it actually polar. So if we have nothing but nonpolar bonds, it's not, it's not polar. Like for instance, if we have, oxygen here. That's, it's a nonpolar bond. It's also a nonpolar molecule. Um, if every bond in a molecule is nonpolar, then by definition, it's nonpolar. Okay. So what we're looking for is how big are the, the bond dipoles? If they're bigger than 0.4, they're worth, they're worth drawing and, <laughs> and worrying about. And if we get them that they don't all cancel out, we get a polar molecule. So let's go back and so this is this is number this is part of, of uh, four, where you just basically you just want to fill in um, this table. So basically go through, look at what the electronegativity, uh, electronegativity difference is, is between these two um, atoms. What kind of bond would it be? Ionic. So here you would say, what's the delta En? So for hydrogen and hydrogen, what, what would be the difference in electronegativity? Yeah. Zero. Yeah, it's no difference. So what kind of bond is that? Is that polar? 
So is that a covalent or ionic? So this is covalent ionic. Covalent. It is covalent. And is it polar or not polar? Non-polar. Non. Yeah, so just go through the, this particular table. That shouldn't, that shouldn't take much time. I just want to show you what you fill in for each one. Okay. Let's do one of the, let's do, start with one of the balloons then. That, that might be fun. And the dogs are going to want to bite the balloons. Right, so everyone has their, has their balloons here. Hey. I'm going to try three. So let's see how you guys do. I should have done this before we, before we started. So it's a good idea just to stretch these out first to make it a little easier to tie them at the end. Right, give myself lots of room. One. Yeah, I guess we try and make them roughly the same size. So there's my two, and you can see when they're linear like that, they're as far away from each other. Any time you move them up or down or in or out, they, the two centers will, are going to get closer to each other. This ought to be interesting. Do you like them individually, or can we just keep adding on to the same structure? Yeah, I would do. Yeah, I would definitely do. Yeah. So what you want to? Yeah, put keep adding on, and then take a picture each time. So now, oh, I fell apart. Now I got to try and put them back together again. That awful sound. All right. <laughs> All right, so now that I got my three, you can see that it takes, if we look at it together, you see how it's both in a plane and the angles between them are about 120 degrees. So this is what I, what I was saying about like the key part of Vesper is the R. It's the repulsion. This is actually kind of a fun exercise because it's because you don't have to really think about it because when you put the balloons together, they automatically take up that that shape because when there's three of them together, they automatically will adopt a shape where they take up as much space as they possibly can and get as far away from the other two as they can. And the more you add, it'll just keep doing that. And so Basically, what you want to do is make a take a picture, and I think they ask you to make a sketch as well. I think that's I think that's 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 part of the um, activity. And you can I don't you can use if you can't tie them together because I think yeah once you get down to about six it gets kind of tricky to try and tie them all together. You could try like taping them together or, or you know something something like that. But you'll notice that they automatically adopt um, the shape that gives it the greatest stability. 
So any questions on how, on, on how to do that part? Um, for the sketch, was there a data table for that? Or do we just do it on the paper? I don't think so. Let me go back and let's, let's, let's have a look. But I might be, I might be wrong about that. I thought they, at some point they wanted a sketch. Let's go back up to, so activity two. Um, so you tie two, three, four, five, six, and then, oh no, I guess you don't. Yes, you just, just take the pictures for that one. Um, when they want the, the sketches, I think it's for number three. So we can we can actually do do um, do one of those now as well. So you can you construct the three dimensional model. So you've got to have um, three from the from group one, three from group two, three from group three, and it runs down which of these are the right atoms. So we said like the black was the um, was carbon. So silver, you see this one is silver and has six prongs on it. So that would have six electron groups. So something like you know, uh, sulfur or, or chlorine Oxygen. or sulfur or, um, or um, uh, phosphorus in the, middle of, in the middle of a, well, oxygen only has uh, four groups, right? It has two lone pairs and two bonds. So oxygen would have four, four, four groups, but something like uh, uh, sulfur or phosphorus can have, phosphorus can have five, sulfur can have six. Remember, because sulfur can, can violate the octet rule. So this would be sulfur. And sulfur we, should be yellow, really. Are we supposed to copy that data table? Which data table? On the screen. Um, yeah, so um, label each model, photograph as for future reference, sketch the perspective drawing of each compound. And so um, basically you don't have to, what you would do is just like have a, have a table like this where you give the name of the molecule. It's like, for instance, if you had, let's say, sulfur dioxide. So you figure out how many electron domains is there in that. And so you, once you've drawn, so how many would you have in there? So basically it helps to have the Lewis model first to know how you're gonna put these things um, together. So sulfur, how many electrons around sulfur? Valence electrons on, on sulfur. Six. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we put this together. Um, we're going to have 18 uh, electrons. Sulfur is going to be um, in, in the middle. So what kind of, when we put that together, what's that going to look like? Everybody's got to have eight. It's going to be a bond between sulfur and oxygen. Yeah, there's one. One double. Mm -hmm. bond. And it'll make a double bond, right? Because salt oxygen doesn't have enough uh, electrons here. Now it only has seven. It needs eight. So it'll share another one and another one. So when you're left with is...
So when we talk about electron domains, we're looking at the central atom. So how many electron domains are there with this molecule here? Basically, how many areas of what, so what it's asking is how many areas of electron density are there around the sulfur? Two? Not two. And not five. Basically, we're looking at how many areas. Now, a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond are all single areas, because basically it means that the electrons are all in the same area. There's more of them, but they're all in the same area. So how many different areas of electron density are there around that sulfur? Three, right. We have one here, we have a double bond on this side, we have a double bond on that side, and we have a lone pair on the top for a total of three. So it's three areas of electron density. So electron domains, we'd say there are three. And so it would adopt a shape like this, where the sulfur's in the middle, there's one oxygen there, there's one oxygen there, and one lone pair on the top. So that's why this would look bent. Okay, so it's not linear. Why isn't it linear? Even though we've got carbon dioxide is linear, so carbon dioxide is linear, but sulfur dioxide is bent. Why is that? I mean, they look pretty much the same. Why is this a line and this one is bent? Because of the lone pairs. Because of the lone pair, exactly. And so what lone pairs do is that they basically, they repulse the other electron groups. So this lone pair repulses this electron group over here, and this electron group over there. It repulses them because they're all negatively charged. And so these get bent a tiny bit. The fact that um, this is a double bond and this is a double bond means that those are going to um, repel each other as well, but it's gonna be slightly bent. So that's what you would do for, for this table. So you would have, each of your, um, each of your um, uh, particular molecules, you'll have nine of them, you'll say how many electron domains there are around the central atom, and then the shape. And then you just draw the shape. Like they say, if necessary, using wedges and dashes to, throw, to show the, the, the three-dimensional shape like they've got here. So can I just do that on a piece of paper because I didn't copy that thing. Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just just make a table like this. Okay. Yeah, just draw it. That's fine. Yeah, because basically you can't use this table anyway because it already has the the stuff in there. Basically, it's 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 a it's a guide to show you what they're what they're looking for. So the first first row would be molecule. Second one would be electron domains. And then the third one would be what shape is it? And so you would, if it has no lone pairs, it's this shape, one lone pair, it's this shape, and so on and so on. Do you want to, we can uh, do another one. If you want to, let's, let's go back to the molecules involved and let's go away. All right, so here's here is our um, okay. Here's our group one, group two, and group group three again. So, uh, which 
would you like to look at? Which would you like to, to draw out as a group? Let's pick one that's like fairly complex. 17. 17. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. All right, so that was uh, bromomethane. Okay. So our molecule is All right, so which is our central atom? Carbon. Carbon. So I'm gonna pick out <clears throat> my carbon. It's gonna have, these are my bonds. So hydrogens are gonna be represented by, basically just by, by these, right? Just. So I'll put one there. I have four bonds kind of going to my carbon. So I just take four of these tubes, put them together. So I want three white balls that represent the hydrogens. And then my bromine, and basically I can just pick anything I want as long as it's a different color. So I'll pick this yellow one. Because basically all it shows is that the bromine is, is different, right? So my bromine is gonna have a different electronegativity. So these three are hydrogens, all with the same electronegativity. And this one is bromine with a different one. And the white, but they just represent a bond. Okay. So when it's time, so how many, so this is my molecule. How many electron groups around the central carbon? Four, right. There's four bonded electron groups. Are there any lone pairs? Could you stop the dogs, please? So are there any lone pairs here on the carbon? No. No, because carbon has only four valence electrons, they're all being shared, so it doesn't have any electrons left over. So if I have four electron groups and no lone pairs, what shape is that? A uh, pyramid? Right, that is my, so you look up, you see which group that is. Do you guys have a table um, showing you what, what all the different uh, groups of shapes are? I think they tell us in the balloon activity. Yeah, but, you, but do you have a like a guide as to like what, um, you know, two electron groups, three, four, five, six. Okay, get them out of here. Thank you. Do you have a guide as, as to like how many, um, activity three, there's a table. Yeah, but I don't think you have a table of all the shapes. So what I'll do is I will put in I will put an announcement. I have a really good table that has all this information in it because you, you don't have to memorize all this stuff. You just, just have a table. So yeah, so four groups, no lone pairs. That's the pyramid or we call it a tetrahedral, right? Tetrahedral. So when it's time to draw this, I've got my carbon. I got my hydrogen, my hydrogen, my hydrogen, and my bromine. So if I want to show the, the 
dipoles, what are the, the um, electronegativity differences here? So I've got carbon, hydrogen, and bromine. What are, what are my three electronegativities? Hydrogen is 2.1. Yep. Carbon is 2.5. 2 2.5. 2.8. means 2.8? Is that all it is? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was more. Okay. So let's draw our dipoles. So um, what direction are the carbon... <laughs> Oh, for God's sake. What direction are the carbon-hydrogen uh, dipoles? What direction are they pointing? Towards the carbon. Towards the carbon, right. So I've got one, two, three. And what about the carbon-bromine dipole? What direction is that pointing? Toward the bromine. Toward the bromine, right. So this direction. So the question is, do I have a net? Is there a net dipole? Do they all cancel each other out or don't they? They do not. They do not, right. Because if we add them all together, we can see that they're all pointing towards carbon except for one. So if I was to draw a net dipole, it would be slightly in that direction. And so, in, so to put my, put the three dimensional spin on it, I would just put like one of these, I would put like a cross hatch and the other one, I would put that wedge to give you an idea that it's, that it's, that it's three dimensional. And I think that fills in our table. Yeah, because it, it wanted, um, the, the one at the, the molecule, the electron groups, and the shape. So this is our molecule. Oops. Go back. Oops. Yeah, so this this would be our molecule. We have our electron groups, shape is tetrahedral, and then you would just draw something like that, and then your net dipole would be like that. So for when it's time to, to make these, if you have a lone pair, these little paddles represent lone pairs, okay? So for instance, if you have um, oxygen, you take the, one of the red ones, which also has four groups, so one of them is going to be a lone pair. Another is going to be a second lone pair. And then you would have the two hydrogens. So this would be, this is what water would look like. So water would look like that. So you would only see, so we say that it's bent rather than tetrahedral, because when we look at water, we only see the nuclei, right? We only see the atoms. So we can see the hydrogen here, and we can see the hydrogen here, and we can see the oxygen in the middle. We don't see the lone pairs. But what we can see is the effect on the shape. So just, so by making this model, it becomes a little bit more apparent why water is bent, because, with these two Mickey Mouse ears here. Basically, there's, you have two lone pairs of electrons in space and they deflect these two bonds away from it, giving you this, giving you this bent shape. So 
So any other questions before I sort of let everyone go off and do what they need to do? Or would you like to get started? Um, I'll come back in like 15 or, or, or 20 minutes and see how everyone's doing. You want to you wanna do it that way? Just check in on everybody. I think you can keep the balloons. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to want your balloons after you've been, you know, drooling on them. Do you want to get started on it? And I'll, I'll come back in a while and check check and see if you have questions. Would that be a good way to, to proceed? Riss is on board. If she's on board, I'm on board. All right, so I'll give everyone, um, I don't know, 15 minutes, and I'll check in if, uh, if you have any, have any questions. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss them and then you guys will be on your own to finish up, okay? All right. So I will see you in 15. So, beryllium dichloride. So, how many, first, I mean, before you make any of these models, I think it's important to draw the Lewis diagram because that will help you. So how many valence electrons does beryllium have? Two. Two. Can folks hear me? Oh, you're absolutely right. Wrong headphones. Okay, brilliant. How many? <laughs> how many um, valence electrons in beryllium? Two. Two. And how many in chlorine? Seven. Seven, right. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got two of them. So how many bonds is beryllium going to make with the two chlorines? Two. Two, right. So, so what we're going to wind up with is really in the middle. <laughs> and a chlorine on each side with one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So the question is how many, um, so that's, that's our molecule. How many electron groups are around the central beryllium? Two, right, we have two. So there's one, so we have a bond here. So we have a bonding pair there and a bonding pair there. So we have one, two electron groups around the central beryllium. So what shape does that make? It's a linear. Linear, right. So the, the easiest way or the best way to, to put the maximum distance between those two electron groups is to put them in a line 180 degrees apart. So that would be linear. And so, oh, also, what is the electronegativity of beryllium and chlorine? The chlorine, I think, is what, 3.5? Three, 3. I think it's chlorine. The beryllium is 1.5. 1.5? 1. Yeah. yeah, chlorine is 3.0. Three, oh, 3.0, right. Um, really? 3.0? I thought it was higher than that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So beryllium is 1.5. So which direction are do our... Um, dipoles point in? 
like right where they went. Like that was like back here. Toward the chlorine. Toward the chlorines, right. So they're gonna <laughs> look like that. So the okay. same same size because the the difference in electri the electronegativity is the same. So the size is relative to the diff to the difference in electronegativity. So they should be the same size. But since it's linear, one's pointing away, they're both pointing away from the beryllium at exactly the same but opposite angle. So what is going to be my net dipole moment? Yeah, they cancel. So my net dipole moment is zero. So I've got two very polar bonds, like extremely polar bonds, almost ionic. Um, because remember, ionic is like 1.8. And so this is about as, as close to being an ionic compound as you can get without it being quite an ionic compound. Even though beryllium is a metal, and these two are non-metals, it's still a, a polar bonds, but together it's a non-polar compound. Can I ask a question? Yes. So when you do that one with the, um, the, uh, the, the blocks, when you have the lone pairs for the chlorine, do you have to demonstrate that or only no. the lone only, yeah, because they don't, they don't affect the shape. The only time the lone pairs affect the shape of the molecule is around the central atom. That's a really good uh, point that I, I forgot to make. Yeah, we only put the, we only put the, the lone pairs on the central atom because the lone pairs around the atoms on the outside don't, don't affect the shape at all. Yeah, because the two chlorines are as far away from each other as they possibly can be. They could have you know, 18 lone pairs and it doesn't make any difference to the shape but lone pairs in the middle really affect the shape. So if you want to figure out how to make that, basically what you need is to find something that you can make linear in the middle. So something like this will stand in for beryllium because what you need is something that, where you can put, you know, two going in opposite directions. So that'd be your central beryllium and then one atom of chlorine be on opposite sides. So there'd be your two bonds coming out of the beryllium and then you just put like a couple of green. Generally when we, we make these sort of things we make the, the, the halogens like a green color even though it's really only chlorine that's, 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 that's green. Or you can make it yellow or really whatever you want. I mean, it is like so. So it would look like that. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Yeah, the color really doesn't matter. You put like carbon definitely should be like be black because that, that, we, we always think of carbon as looking like either, you know, pencil lead or something, graphite, and that's, that's dark. Um, so usually in, in uh, sets of these things, the carbon is gonna be black. The hydrogen's usually white. Um, oxygen is usually red, but not always. Uh, nitrogen is usually represented by blue, but then it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Keep your, the carbon should be black, hydrogen should be white, and then other than that, you're sort of free to, to do whatever. As long as, just as long as you have the shape correct. That's the main thing. All right, anything else? There's no here. Oh, I'm gonna do Go ahead. For the data table in activity three, uh, is that where we do the drawing? Activity table in data, yeah. Activity okay. table in data table, activity three. Let me 
see. Do the table three. Where is our data table three? Oh, also, do you have to take pictures of every single um, like block structure? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you just want to, if yeah, I mean, you should. But where is data table three? Where the hell is data table three? Way at the end. Oh, not that far. Not that far. <laughs> That's four. That's data table two. Where's three? Uh, it was actually, I think it's called activity three or something. Oh, this one? Um, no. It's on page 22. 22. Let me know when you're getting there. Oh, man. This thing is a little... Twenty-two. Mm -hmm. The one where it says activity three, molecular geometry, because we had to make nine of those. Right. Right. So yeah. So you take um. Yeah, three. So three of these, three of these, and three of these, and then yeah, just make make a table where um how many how many um electron <laughs> domains are there how many lone pairs are there what's the geometry the bond angles and then just do do the uh drawing like like that <laughs> I don't know why that's what he was something yeah something that that'd be your long your line drawing the bond angles since this tetrahedral would be 109.5 geometry is tetrahedral zero lone pairs four electron domains okay yeah oh and also the lone pairs count as electron domains right yes yes yeah yeah, so 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 water, for instance, would also have four domains. One, two, three, four. So basically it's asking you for electron domains. It's like basically what all that means is a domain is an area of electron density. So a single bond is one, a double bond, also one, a triple bond, also one, because they're electrons, there's but they're in the same area. And then a lone pair is also an area where, the, where you'll find electrons. Thank you. Okay? All right. I'm gonna have to chase the ice cream truck as it goes by. I don't know if you guys could hear it. It's just outside the window. Um, I have a question, Professor. Yes. Um, how to build a double bone? Like they, they said we, we need to and that two two wide tube, yeah. but like it is only is only can build one wide tube. So for two, yeah. Like if you were drawing, if you were making carbon dioxide, for instance, so So here'd be my carbon in the middle, and it's got a single bond between the two oxygens on the, on the outside. But then I need to add another, another bond. And actually what you can do, you notice that we have short ones and long ones. The short ones you can use for single, oops, the short ones you can use for single bonds, the longer ones for doubles because you're going to need the longer ones to make the double bonds. Where are my long ones, long ones, long ones?
Damn it, now they're all short. So when you make carbon dioxide, you would put two bonds between each one. So notice what happens when you, when you have two bonds connecting each one, you get the linear shape back again. So oh. we have a carbon in the middle, whoop, carbon in the middle, oxygen's on the outside, but notice the overall shape is linear, okay? Okay. Because if, okay. because if you don't put the two bonds there, then um, it won't it won't be linear, right? It'll be bent. Yeah. And we know that carbon dioxide isn't bent; it's linear. And this this sort of does a nice job when you make when you make the model of explaining why. Okay. Got it. Yeah. No problem. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, when will you post this recording or today? Uh, probably tomorrow. Yeah, I'll, I'll also post the um, the table I was I was I was telling you about that basically has all the has all the shapes because that's that's something that's something you can keep for for a reference for like tests and that sort of thing. Because it's really it's really hard to memorize all all these different things, especially when these shapes take, you know, you get these really bizarre shapes with like you know six electron groups if you you know four bonds and two lone pairs and you get these like really bizarre shapes so i'll i'll, I'll post that so so you have it all right any anything else remember you can always just just um Send me an email or, or pop into um, office hours. You want you want to go over this in, any more? All right, we're up to two hours. So I will see 